Welcome to CXO Unplugged. I'm Phil Dobby, and with me is Don May. He's the CEO of uh, Domino's. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Phil. Uh, and a big smile on your face because you've you've just uh, announced a, a good end of year result for for last financial year. Profits up, debt down. Yeah, it's it's been a great year. Um, mm. You know, profits up nearly thirty percent. Um, you know, sales up as a network up fourteen point four percent. And um, yeah, our debt's almost zero. It's down 77%. I mean, it was already really low. Mm. Now it's nearly at zero. So we've got a really strong uh, balance sheet. And as a result, we're paying strong dividends, a 55% payout ratio. And we're suspending a DRP. You know, as a, uh, as a company, ever since we've listed, we've never gone to the market to raise capital and we've grown significantly. Right. Um, so we're really proud of that. So what's happened to the, the global financial crisis? What, what are you doing right? Yeah, well, I think... Um, We've said, when we listed, we said pizza was a staple. I mean, I've been in the business 22 and a half years, mm. and, um, and all of my experience said that people are going to eat. Pizza is very affordable. When times are good, um, you know, some of the lower end of the market might trade up, and some people leave us. When things get a little tough, some of the people that have been dining at cafes come back down, and we lose some people out of the bottom end right. um, of the market. So um, we do really sit there quite, um, you know, we move. And, um, but what we did do for this economy, because we've got a lot more experience now, is we really targeted it. So that's why we, we actually maximised it, I suppose. We, we made some assumptions, and um, no one's Nostradamus, but you know, you're sitting there and you are a little nervous when you're making those assumptions, but mm. they have paid off. Mm. You know, we built a menu for this economy, and it's delivered. But you're, I mean, we're expecting good times to kick back over the next yes. year, but you're still saying next year's going to be good as well. You're still yeah, forecasting yeah. another 15, 10 to 15%. And there's a really important thing about that is that the work that we've done in this economy is people that were le leaving cafes and coming down to our business, we're rising up to meet their expectations. Right. And because what we said is that who knows how long a, a downturn in the economy is going to last. Let's, when they come to us, let's make sure that we give them a product that's been upgraded, so a better quality product with more choice, a better service. I mean, our delivery times have improved 21% over the last six months because we've been able to get more drivers, so we're really invested in that. Um, so a better service and a better image. So the way our packaging is, uh, upgrading our stores. So that in fact, when um, you know, in another six, 12 months, who knows when the economy is turning, that people say, you know what, pizza's actually, it's been modernized and it's something that I really, really like and more of them will, more of them will stick. In fact, there's, it, there's a lot of um, uh, commentary being made and in research that um, customers actually have changed as a result of what's happened in the last 12 months mm. and that they're probably gonna be a little bit more free and a little bit of the bling's gone out of their life. Right. And, um, and so, you know, we think, I mean, pizza's gonna do well, it's quite resilient anyway, but we think that we've built a menu and we're hoping to illustrate that that will flow into the, uh, the next few years. And you've extended that menu as well, of course. It's not just pizza now, it's, that's it's exactly pasta right. as well. Yeah, and that's what, what's happening is when customers are coming to us and they haven't bought pizza in a number of years, and we were just pizza, coke and garlic bread, mm. all of a sudden now we've got fresh made to order pasta, we've got a new dessert range. Um, and, um, and we're gonna be even expanding more extensions. You know, we sell a lot of chicken products today. And so when pizza is a shared food at the table, we would have got a veto vote, particularly with females over 25 years of age. Mm. Um, you know, she was quite happy when, uh, when it was just her and her, her boy friend or fiance or whatever he could win but she at 25 said you know what I'm changing the, what happens in our house and we didn't often have a product for her um, because maybe pizza wasn't in her repertoire of what she wanted to eat um, and especially mums with young kids and so on as much as the young kids love it mum would often be the veto so we've now got more products for her right. and so that's another thing why we think that into the new economy um, as we go forward um, where we've we've been educating the customer hey you know what Domino's has got a lot of great options high quality products uh, for the future and something that's been very strategic for us is that We've seen a trend that we believe that how do you get high restaurant quality food and take it to QSR, quick service restaurants. Yeah. You know, our chocolate lava cake that sells for $2.95 in most stores. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a $15 restaurant product. We, we make that fresh. Right. You know, it's real chocolate uh, mix that we bake fresh in a muffin tray through our stores, so you know, for two ninety five. dollars And you're changing, you talked about, right, so this is all part of the raising expectations, I guess. And you it talked is. about uh, mm -hmm. the stores as well. You're changing the look of the stores. So, I mean, that must be a big investment. How do you get that right? Mm -hmm. How do you, because you, you've got to make that call and roll we it out. We do, and it's, it, it is a long process, you know, mm -hmm. when you start getting a colour palette of what you think you should be like, what, what's the trends, you know, our new colour palette's a lot warmer, it's got a lot more integrity to, to food. You know, Domino's has always been very loud and bright, you know, red, mm. white and blue and like a neon light and, you know, the, uh, the 90s and the early 2000s, it was the right thing to be a beacon and scream out loud and clear, one cookie cutter vision fit it all and it did work. Um, but as our business is maturing now, you know, and consumers are changing a little bit more, why can't it, Domino's look different 
on, um, on, on a number of different street corners. In fact, we have 10 different versions of our new look. There's right. a consistency. It's very clearly Domino's branded, very clearly Domino's menu. But as you walk in, um, you know, there might be beach locations. There might be inner city. There might be more urban, suburban, you know, country town looks and so on. Mm. And so, therefore, it's my Domino's. And more to appeal to women? Is that part of the, it, the it, idea it's, as well? It's part of it. But, mm. um, I mean, we, we don't want to overemphasize that because we're almost 50-50 men and women who buy from us anyway. Right. Um, you know, it's just a slight skew to male. Um, now the business has got. I mean, it's it's a, a combination of stores that are that are owned by Domino's and and then franchises. That's right. Yeah. Does that create challenges? I mean, do you spend more time, for example, looking after a franchise store than a, a wholly owned store, the, or the other way around? No. In, in in if you have a look at the actual investment in our business, then per unit, then a corporate store requires more attention because it's our store. We've got to lead by example, mm. and it's a more of um, we get the whole dollars in that case. In a franchise business, an entrepreneur who's bought the business, they bought it, they want some freedom. They don't, you know, as much as they're part of a system, and that can be frustrating sometimes for them, that they, ha they are part of a system, but they are entrepreneurs and yep. they don't want to be overmanaged. So our job is to make sure that we give them the tools so that they can be successful, that we do make sure that we check the quality of the system because, you know, you don't want your peer up the road letting you down. Yep. You wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't want you to let down your peer. Um, so we need to make sure the standards are, are maintained. Um, and then as a cooperative, they get all the benefits of the buying power and all the marketing and positioning and, and all of the uh, knowledge and technology. I mean, we spend a lot of money um, both in our business and in Domino's worldwide. I mean, we're the largest group of Domino's uh, stores in the world, mm. um, but there are six and a half thousand Domino's, uh, sorry, eight and a half thousand Domino's stores worldwide. So I guess the big issue when you're choosing uh, franchises is making sure you have the right franchisee at the beginning. You know, if you, if you get that right, then it's easier to manage ongoing. Yeah, there's no question about that. And um, you know, one of the things we offer and we've been successful at is actually multi-unit franchising because mm. one of the things about uh, being an individual store franchisee is you do go into those same uh, four walls, it's 100 square metres, you're dealing with Gen Y in yeah. the most recent years. And, um, and so you know, it can become Groundhog Day. So what we've done, and, and there's enough margin in the Domino's business, you can become a multi-unit Owner. Yeah. And then you get a whole set of new skills. Not everybody makes it there, but a lot of our people do. I mean, I was a multi-unit franchisee. I had 17 stores, 500 staff, and it, and it grows your skills. I mean, I've been able to grow on and become the CEO of the whole group, but I developed those skills in that sort of period, uh, you know, running a bigger business. Now, as well as multi-unit franchisees, you've got a lot of competitors in, in local areas where people establish their own brand of, uh, That's of right. pizza. Is that your biggest competitor? Uh, in actual quantum of pizza sold in Australia, yeah, the independent uh, stores do mm. make up a, a significant amount. So chains make up about half and independents the other half. But they're not always a direct competitor because people do go to an independent for a different reason to why they go to a chain. You know, somebody knows Gino and he's owned the business. Um, he's probably of some sort of um, ethnic, you know, background and he's owned it for a number of years and mm. people are going to them for that reason. Um, and then they're coming to us for the more consistency of product, service, image, innovation. You know, um, in many cases, even um, people are often surprised at the quality of ingredients that come from a chain. And that's the things that's changed over a number of years. You know, independents might have been in that space, but. Uh, chains with their buying power and their upgrade have actually risen and in many cases uh, you know that's another reason why you're coming to a chain but um, they are a competitor but but not always a direct competitor uh, you know our biggest competitors are companies like Pizza Hut. Right so when you're looking for growth in the business you're looking to take business away from Pizza Hut? Well we've got five countries at the moment and they're all different phases in their growth. In Australia we're a little bit more mature mm. and so we already have 50% of chain pizza in Australia and a quarter of all pizza consumed in Australia so it's a significant market share. How, give us some big figures then, how many pizzas is that? Um, well we actually sell 50 million pizzas as a system in Australia and New Zealand. Right. So. Um, you know, and we talk about Australia and New Zealand as one region and we talk about Europe as another region and um, so you know, large market share we, and in most of our history, we have taken a lot of share off our competitors, but today it's just about a, a, as much about um, growing the pizza pie. Mm. You know, more share of stomach that, that the pizza category gets. So as the market leader, it's our job to drive the pizza category. And, um, and so that's probably a bigger focus today, hence the extension of menu, the upgrade to menu, um, new innovative and exciting ideas, the way we're positioning our stores and so on. That's about growing the segment as much as anything. Um, if we get some market share out of that as well, it's a bonus. And we do think we'll go from 50 to 60% market share, so we still have about a 20% growth yep. um, on a you know, like for like. And, uh, but hopefully 60% of a much bigger pie. Now, quality obviously is important. You talked about the quality of ingredients. The quality of services is important as well. Exactly. You mentioned Gen Y. 
Mm. Uh, and I mean, some people think they're, they're, they're a difficult bunch to control. Mm. And you've got lots of them yeah. working for you, either directly or for franchises. Yeah, so we've got 15,000 staff and, um, you know, probably the largest portion of those uh, team members today are Gen Y. Right. And, um, Is that a challenge to manage? Look, there's some differences. I think it gets sometimes overextended because, in all honesty, they're human beings. They've got very similar interests, mm. you know. Uh, but one, there are some, some differences and um, it's got to be a lot more fun than it ever has been before, you know. Let's be honest, the girlfriend comes first, uni comes second and the job funds the first two. No. So um, so we've got to always remember that and we've got to make sure while we engage them as best we possibly can at work, you know, they've got these other distractions going on. And um, so make sure it's always a lot of fun um, that they're being recognised and rewarded. Um, you know, we've got, you know, for example, even in our office, our IT guys are all Gen Y pretty well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've got, you know, wee competitions on, tennis competitions going on, you know, uh, coffee taste testing, chocolate taste, te taste testing, just to make sure they're engaged. And, and Domino's is more than just a place that I you know, get some money. Yeah. Um, it's also a place that really does engage me. It's a lot of fun. Right. I might even meet my new girlfriend. I can be a different guy, you know, at Domino's than I am in my other life. Uh, <laughs> so I can reinvent myself, you know. And so, yeah, we've, we've got to make sure we set up that platform. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it has been, an, you know, from time to time it's been an issue in stores that haven't looked after general I mean, we've got higher turnover. Yeah, okay. So it's keeping you young as well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Less convinced on yeah, that one. Yeah. So you've been in pizza all your life, just about. I mean, you started uh, in pizza delivery. Correct, yeah. So 22 and a half years ago now. And right. um, yeah, so I'm 40 years of age now. So more than half my life has been in the pizza business. And um, and hopefully a significant part of the rest of my life is going to be in this business. It's a great business. And it, you know, today we're 776 stores. Um, we have the ability just in the countries we have now to conservatively get to 1,600 stores. So we've got a lot of growth ahead of us. And um, I mean, pizza is so much fun. You know, <laughs> I, all day, every day I get to engage in pizza. So. And how many pizzas a week do you eat? Um, it's getting less and less as time goes on, but uh, you know, with our product development kitchen, our Love Lab is just below my floor. Obviously, when you're touring stores, you're often having a pizza. So probably three to four times a week, I, right. I'd eat a pizza. It used to be almost every day. Uh, but yeah, now, I mean, we've got such a wide menu now, I might eat pasta, I might eat chicken as well. So, yeah, but I eat our menu, yeah, at least, you know, three, four times a week. So having worked in the industry and knowing the industry very well, I mean, do, do you ever worry about perhaps that outside influence? Do you think that perhaps, you know, because you've worked in this area for so long, mm. Um, you're almost becoming cocooned in it, and, mm. uh, and uh, as a manager, it, it, it limits your thinking. Yeah, look, I think it's really important the kind of quality of advisors that you bring to business. We've got mm. some fantastic advisors, both from, whether it be from a financial point of view, from a brand point of view. Um, we, you know, one of the, the characteristics of our company is we say, look, we hire an agency to challenge us to take us to another place. You yeah. know, you, you're right, we, we convince ourselves all the time, things that are great that maybe times moved on and they're not as great as they once were. You know, it might have been best practice, it's no longer best practice. And we need somebody to come in and be completely honest with us. And uh, you know, uh, for the first time after 15 years, we hired a new agency two years ago. They've been fantastic, the Campaign Palace here in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, the agencies we have in Europe have been awesome in launching our brand there. You know, we're the market leader in France, we're the market leader in the Netherlands today because of what uh, they've been able to help us do. Our advisors financially, I mean, they help us list. I mean, they do, they challenge us. And, um, and that's the same with our people. We bring in expertise. Um, along the way, it's been unfortunate, we have unfortunately outgrown some people as the business has got so big mm. and we need to bring in new skills. Um, one of the great things about size though is you also bring in new areas. We, you know, we have digital marketers today. You know, we have specialists look at our yield analysis of you know, the yield of a pizza. You know, like, mm. um, in other words, how are we giving the best value out of our, our business? I mean, we didn't have those people. And they're specialists. They have certain skills and, um, and they challenge us, bringing them in that they're there to challenge the yeah. status quo. Yeah. So what's the, what's the future hold? 15% growth in profit next year? 10 to 15% next year, that's right. Yep. How, are you, how are you going to achieve that? More stores. Uh, one of the things about Europe is when we bought the European business, we bought it off the American parent and um, it had a zero royalty base and we've had to step that up over a further three years to 3%. That's quite a significant amount of taxing because that comes straight off the top line. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite a material amount of dollars. So this mm. is the last year of that. Uh, increase. Uh, so we, we finished this year in Europe at 3%. Um, so when you, we talk about the numbers, that's growth on top of that extra taxing. Then when you look at 2011, there's no more extra taxing. All the compounding effect of all the new stores we're opening, the great same store sales like for like we're getting. Um, and so, you know, the economies of scale that just start to flow through. It becomes really incredible for us for in Europe. Because see, one of the limiting factors we have in Australia and New Zealand is there is only 21 million mm. people in Australia, another four and a half in, in New Zealand. Mm. 
it's a small market, you know. Well, 22 million by Christmas. 22 million by Christmas, <laughs> yeah. We're working hard <laughs> but, on that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you can't just uh, grow by the population growth, can you? No, that's, that's right. Sure. And, and, you know, like if I could add another um, three or 400 stores in Australia, I mean, the economies would f be phenomenal. Mm. I've got that in Europe. We've got that there, you know. Like, what could France really be? There's 60 million people in France. You know, you add Belgium and uh, Netherlands, another 26 million. So we've got, you know, 86 million people there. Um, you know, four times what we're dealing with here. Mm. And uh, so, you know, the, the upside's... Uh, even bigger and ironically um, pizza is quite uh, well known in those countries I mean you know there's 12,000 pizza shops in France alone yeah um, but what we're doing as a chain is new and innovative so it's so immature in that sense and so you know we've got such a long growth curve ahead of us that um, it's gonna be you know we've got an exciting future so what about Italy is that a big call <laughs> yeah I think Italy is a big call I think uh, you know we've, we've got so much growth what we've got to do today that uh, yeah, there's not too much maverick going on. You want to dive in straight into <laughs> Italy and uh, pretend to teach the Italians, but um, you never say never do anything because, you know, one of the things that happens is what pizza is today is not what pizza was 20 years ago or 100 years ago. It's, mm. And with that innovation, we're, we feel we're at the cutting edge of that with technology, um, the way you can buy a pizza. And we're going to launch the iPhone in the next few months. And, you know, that's fantastic because that iPhone is going to be able to tell you live, that, you know, it's, it's on the make line being made. No, it's in the oven. Actually, it's leaving the store and it's on its way to you and you've got it right. in your hand. You know, um, <laughs> that empowerment changes the game. Yeah. And the investment in those technologies can't be underestimated um, how significant they are and they give us a competitive edge. Yeah. Um, and so that slowly but surely you reshape yourself. One day you wake up and you go, hey, you know what? This model could be something that could be taken into another country. Right. So the biggest risk out of all of this, what, what do you think is the, the, <clears throat> the, the, the thing that could make it all fall apart? Yeah, the things that can make it fall apart, we've always talked about some of our biggest risks is competitive risk. Mm. So somebody innovates and outdoes us um, because we haven't changed. Um, you know, in all honesty, Pizza Hut owned this market in Australia. And uh, you know, Pizza Hut was 427 stores today, roughly 290 stores, you know, the tables turned. We were the third player in the marketplace, we're now the dominant number one. Things can change. And um, so you can't be too arrogant, you've got to make sure you are listening to the customer. You know, we need to keep reminding ourselves we've got to be the customer's champion. Mm. You know, so many times when you're in a chain, you systemise things, and it's a system, yeah. it's not always listening to the customer. We've got to say, no, it's the customer first. We, you know, what do they want from us? And if, as long as we continue to keep an ear to the customer, I'm pretty confident that uh, we'll have a strong growth. But the risk is complacency and uh, competitive risk. There's also a risk of internally um, our own innovation. We, we really do depend on that innovation. And if we go stale, we did have one quarter um, two years ago where we did miss the beat. We had three promotions in a, in a row that, that didn't work for us and that impacted our profits. Mm. Um, so innovation's difficult. You've got to make sure you've got the right people, that you've got the right investment, that it's front and centre in your business because it is what people are going to eat in two years' time, we're already thinking about that now um, and what they're going to be eating in 10 years' time and how they're going to engage with Domino's. Um, and that's really important because it will change. Customers are changing. I'll give you an example. In Australia, 80% of our product sold was on a deep pan, deep dish six years ago. Today, that's uh, less than 20%. Yeah. So Australians are eating this heavy dough, heavy fried-based dough. Today, they're not. They're it's eating not a classic work. crust, a thinner crust. Yeah. That's a very short window mm. for your business to change that dramatically. What's the next version of that that comes out? You know, That's going to change. Mm. And um, we've got to be right at the edge of that to make sure that we, we gain leadership. All right. Well, Don, uh, my stomach's been rumbling all through this interview. Fantastic. So it's about time for a pizza. I think Thanks. so. Thanks and a lava much. cake. <laughs> Thank you very much for your <laughs> Thank time. Thank you. Thanks, Phil.